Welcome back to the Home Performance Channel. This is a uh, presentation that I gave at the AHR Expo, which is the big HVAC convention, and at the International Builder Show in 2022. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody could see what it is that we talked about. I made this presentation in partnership with April Air, and we gave it at the booth. We had like pretty good crowds. There's a lot of talk about air quality. Um, and homes and health and everything with the pandemic. And people just don't understand how to craft a ventilation system because the bottom line is there is no such thing as a silver bullet for every home, for every family. You have to learn to address each home where it sits now so that you can induce certain dynamics that you want to achieve. And that takes thinking critically and it takes understanding what the components do and what you're trying to address and having the language, which is why we make the television show Home Diagnosis. This is how we are teaching normal people to understand the physics, chemistry, and microbiology inside homes all the time. Number one, you've got these three different things going on. This physics, chemistry, microbiology, and this is a huge topic, right? But it's very simple when you actually like stop thinking about things like Energy efficiency, for example. I will not talk about energy efficiency in this talk, and I generally don't, because you can kind of disregard it. It's a side effect that you get if you get control over a home. If you just try and focus on the heat bleed, airflow and pressure, moisture, and contaminants in a home, then you have addressed these three things, physics, chemistry, and microbiology. This is more important than ever before to understand because of these three numbers below me. These are all in the same units, if you already know what this is, then uh, you can repeat along with me. This is in years, 78 years, life expectancy of an average American. 70 of those 78 years, we will spend inside of places, buildings, generally. If we add vehicles to that, then it goes slightly above 90% of our lives. 50 years is the amount of time that you will spend inside of your own home. And if we are focused on the uh, food that we eat, making sure that it's organic or that it has the right vitamins or whatever. And we're focused on our water and making sure that it's filtered and you know pure and all that stuff. Those are great. But frankly, we have more air coming in and out of our bodies on a daily basis than anything else. So if you're thinking about your kids who are in your home right now and what might screw them up or give them the edge as they grow up and develop, air is something that you absolutely have to be thinking about. Code is not going to cover what you need to think about in your own home or in the homes of your clients if you're a building professional. Don't bring bad stuff inside. You need to ventilate and you need to keep it dry inside a home. If you do those three things, then that's it. That is the case study. So I'm going to give you specific examples in this presentation. This is going to be pretty fast, by the way. Um, so please do uh, stay tuned. And as, you, as we go, comment below if you have any questions. I personally answer all the comments uh, on our channel. So the first thing you want to do is cover your liability because there are definitely things that you can do to a home that will hurt the people inside. And people are learning more and more about this. And we need to make sure that we're not putting ourselves as building professionals into a situation where we're doing dumb stuff that is going to actually hurt a child. Whether or not you're legally liable at that point doesn't matter because you're going to have nightmares for the rest of your life. So this map is from the US EPA. This is a radon map. And if you have seen this before, you should know that you cannot trust this map at all anymore. This map was last updated almost 30 years ago in 1993. Homes have been getting more airtight over the last 30 years. Homes are very different now than they were before. Even older homes that have been retrofitted, that have had air sealing or insulation work or replaced the windows or additions done to them, they're different now can't trust this map. Also, you can get more recent maps, which look like this. Two things wrong with this map. Number one, this map is available from the CDC and they collect this data from actual homeowners. They say, hey, here's a test kit. I want you to test your own radon with a one point test and then send us the data and let us know what your radon level was. Uh, number one, a one point test is not very good. The only real way to know what your radon level is in your home is to test it continuously. And there are tools out there for less than $200 to enable you to do that. 
That's number one. Number two is having untrained homeowners test their own invisible dynamics is, is a little iffy. We can all probably all agree about that. You yourself might be brilliant, but I bet you agree that most of your neighbors are idiots. So let's just kind of like agree on that. It's, it's not us, it's everybody else. Third thing is, do we really believe that geology looks like this, that radon gas might be coming out of the ground in one of these little red blobs, but not a few miles away across that border where the edge, like, no, that's not how it works at all. That's crazy. So we can't trust this map either. So let me tell you about this house that I'm talking to you from uh, that I now, I built with my parents and we live in, we've lived in for the last year um, and it's great, but it didn't just automatically become great. We had to really work at it. So this house is super airtight. You can see my blower door there in the front uh, door of my house. This house is more than passive house airtight. Passive house being the tightest standard that there is for homes. And you can see in the crawl space here that my uh, black vapor barrier is sticking up around the slab. I personally taped all the seams in that vapor barrier. That vapor barrier is resistant to moisture. It's also resistant to termites. Uh, it's called Pango Wrap. We used it uh, on the entire under the slab on top of the insulation under the slab. And I know that that's taped hardcore. And yet, when we made the house airtight, we had 14 picocuries per liter. The EPA's limit for action, like something is wrong, is four picocuries per liter. If you're somewhere else in the world, you might be using something called Becquerel, which is a different scale. You can look up what the conversion is. But essentially, we needed to plug in this fan in order for my radon mitigation system to work at all. Once we ran the fan, and I'll show you exactly what level we run it at in a second, we have the radon level inside the exact same as it is outside. And you'll hear people say, oh, radon is everywhere all the time. Yes, it's true, but it's less than one picocurie per liter. If you use rounding, it rounds down to zero. And that's, as a dad, where I want mine. I don't want mine to be one, two, three, or four, just shy of four before I get to the action level. I don't want my kids breathing any poison, not just a little bit, but, but literally none. This does work. Now, when you tune your fan, this is important, you can see the uh, pipe coming out of the slab here, and what you put on it is an analog, just a fluid uh, manometer tube that's gonna show you that there's a pressure imbalance inside. That's what you want. You want it to be depressurized inside that pipe. Mine is tuned to a half an inch of water column. The one that's right under me here is tuned to five inches of water column. That is way too much. All you have to do with this fan is suck harder underneath the slab than the house will suck on the sub slab, which is not very hard. So half an inch of water column is plenty. Okay, so off label. If you, if you wanna be able to retrofit a home that does not have a sub slab gravel bed that's four inches deep everywhere that gives you this nice air network where you can suck on all parts under the slab, then you can still do this. I will tell you that if you try to suck underneath a slab that's just packed dirt, you're not sucking anything. It's like trying to suck on a milkshake that's like literally was ice cream one second ago. You're not gonna get any flow through your straw. And so if you don't have the sub slab gravel, what we have done in my parents' crawl space, which is a 1950s ranch, you can see a playlist on that I'm linking on screen. If you can turn this uh, dirty crawl space into this encapsulated crawl space, then we can move on to step two as far as the radon mitigation and covering our liability goes, which looks like this. Now this only works if the crawl space is encapsulated, meaning that it shares air with the house above it and not ever uh, with the outside through the wall. So that means all the vents in the wall have been plugged up. If we hook up an exhaust fan in this room, which looks like a radon fan, but it's no longer a radon fan um, because this is not a radon mitigation system, this is something else. Um, you can pipe an exhaust from the center of the house in the crawl space, which is a big wide open space, and we can allow radon to come up into the crawl space because no one is living down there. And radon is a long-term exposure kind of a thing. You don't, like small spikes in it are not gonna probably hurt you uh, in the long term. But day after day after day, that's when it really gets you. So if we can allow radon to come up into the space and then make sure that we have depressurized our crawl space so that 
air always flows down from the house above into the crawl space and never vice versa, then this works. And by the way, just because stack effect and reverse stack effect in winter and summer work differently, this system is a lot more effective in the summertime when air is already sinking through the house to get into the crawl space. In the wintertime, we have to turn the system up. In the summertime, we turn the system down. So being able to monitor continuously the radon level. And by the way, if you haven't monitored radon continuously, I had literally had somebody at at the AHR Expo come up to me and say, hey, look at this. This is my radon map for my house. And it's not radon map, but the radon test. And it spikes up and down all the time. And yes, that is what happens seasonally, daily, hourly. It'll go up and down because wind, weather, uh, barometric pressure, all kinds of things are changing in the house all the time. The HVAC system kicks on and turns off. Even that can have an effect. So yes, the radon level changes all the time, which is why a one point test is next to useless in my opinion. So now that we've covered our liability, let's cover our health in homes. Uh, so let's talk about air cleaning. Now, what we're trying to filter here, and when I say filter, I really mean literally filter, is particles, chemicals, and microbes. We have big particles that are PM10, and we've got PM2.5. Both of those are too small to see, but they're going to stay in the air longer depending on how small they are, right? And you could have particles floating around in the air for literally days or weeks if they're small enough, which is why masks are a good shield, um, but plexiglass that is just for catching spittle as we talk to each other is probably a lot less effective than masks. So nanoparticles are also what we're worried about here, which are the ones that can just go around anywhere. They could even get down and go into your bloodstream because they're so small, your body doesn't recognize them as a threat. Your, your lungs are babies, essentially. They're infants. They don't know how to protect themselves at all. We're also trying to protect ourselves against both chemicals that are present in our air and also chemical reactions, which you cannot possibly predict or prevent in your home because they're happening all the time. All of this is 100% unavoidable. Even if I am sitting in a room like I am right now, I am polluting this room just by being in here. I am breathing out small bits of formaldehyde. I'm breathing out carbon dioxide, which is also not good for humans. To ingest. I'm, put, I'm sloughing off a cloud of dust uh, every second. It's, <laughs> don't be super grossed out, but that's just what's happening. Like that's life. And so let's handle it. And here's how you do that. You wanna stick to filters and fans, period. If anything that you buy to clean the air has electronics in it, that are more than just a fan, then it's probably bad. And I would say, do not buy that because you don't know what is going to happen. And the people who sell this to you, who make these devices will say, oh no, nothing bad is gonna happen. They cannot possibly know that. And I know this because we work with academic researchers who are world-class. And if they don't know, I guarantee you the people who are trying to sell you stuff cannot possibly know they don't have the, the firepower to throw at studying this stuff. So if you look at the green boxes here, what, what you've got here is two different uh, charts from ASHRAE. One shows filtration factor. The filtration factor of a MERV 11 versus a MERV 13, you're gonna get double the filtration factor if you move up to MERV 13. That's great. If you move from a MERV 13 to a MERV 16, that seems like it would be a lot more of a gain, but it's actually not on the filtration factor side as you see it if, as we go from the blue to the um, silver box. But as far as the particle filtration goes, what you can see here is that MERV 11 filters do not grab any small particles at all, zero. When we move down to the blue, a MERV 13 is going to grab 85% of big particles and 25% of small particles. So if you can get multiple passes, if you're filtering your air, you know, circulating the air in your home twice an hour, then you could probably grab 50%. But of course, you're generating more particles in between the filtration cycles. Um, so if you move up to a MERV 16, you're getting 95% of both big particles and small particles. And that is great. By the way, HEPA is, starts at MERV 17. And the, the curve, when you hear somebody talk about how HEPA uh, filters out 99.97% of particles down to 0.3 microns, which is the same as 300 nanometers, and then they stop, they don't tell you what it is underneath that, it's because it's a U-curve. So if you can grab 
the 0.3 microns, then everything south of that, all the smaller stuff, is actually really easy to grab. So that, that is the, the hardest uh, diameter to grab, apparently. So anyway, that's what that means. Now, here's your case study. If we're in a house in Long Island that one of my clients actually has, they have a super airtight home because they know that airtightness is important, and that is true. They are on the beach, so you're trying to filter not just for normal particles like pollen and dust and uh, smog particles and things like that, but also uh, salt that is suspended in the air. You're going to have a lot more aerosols, which are little droplets and little bits of things floating around in the air, and you want to filter those out before they come inside. Um, so we have that going on. We also have ductless mini splits in this house because my client has decided that that's what they wanted. They, they had a terrible experience with a duct system in the past, which is sad, and they want to be able to not use ducts at all. I will say a couple times in this presentation, you got to have a duct system of some kind. So what we can do, if we really are going to use ductless mini splits for heating and cooling, is three things. We can do nothing. That's not a good idea. Um, we can depend on the ASHRAE ventilation level, which is, for this home, a, a home this size, is about 100 CFM. That's also not a lot, and I'll, I'll do the math for you in a second. Or we can put filter units in each room. That means a HEPA filter in five rooms. That means I'm going to have a lot more filters to change and inspect. I'm going to have a lot more machinery that's going to be drawing energy that's going to be breaking down. That's also not a very elegant thing. So the fourth solution, which is the one that I would recommend, would be to uh, add a filter and a fan with a small ductwork. Because again, you got to have a ductwork. So if we take the bedrooms upstairs and supply air to them through a small ductwork, that has a fan attached to it. And let's talk about the sizing of the fan. If we take the square footage of the house times the ceiling height, we get the cubic footage. That is 13,850. If we divide that by 60, it'll tell you how many CFM you'd need to run through a fan so that you could get one air change of all of the air. All the air in the house would be filtered once an hour. That number is 230 CFM. So if I got a 230 CFM fan, which is totally doable. One of those radon fans that we were talking about could probably be turned up to that uh, level. Then you could uh, filter all the air. If you put on a nice filter, let's just say a MERV 16, which would grab 95% of both sizes. Once an hour, you get all that air filtered. If you want to do more like serious school ventilation for COVID, then you'd go for four air changes per hour, which again is less than 1,000 CFM. You can get lots of fans. They're, those are more kind of commercial models, but again, we're just talking about these. They're, they're Tinker Toys. They're Legos. You just put them together in different combinations. You can get a hold of anything at a supply house. An HVAC professional can do this for you. Then we can supply to the bedrooms upstairs, drawing from the living space downstairs, and we've set up a pressure imbalance in the house that, that guarantees, essentially, that we will have the air in the house circulating. That is very useful. So, now that we've covered our liability, we've covered our health, let's cover our dilution air, because number one, this is code in most places in the country. If you're building airtight homes, which we all are, on accident, or on purpose, I don't. if you think you're building homes the same way your granddad did, then you're either naive or you're lying because that's literally not possible nowadays. Codes, materials, totally different. So we're long past that. By the way, let me just say, wood-burning fireplaces, that's not really a thing anymore. That's 16th century technology that you're trying to plug into a 21st century home. So be very careful about that. And by the way, I am available for consulting if you have specific uh, case studies that you'd like to work on with me. So ventilation. Here's two cheap ways that you can do it. And, and when I say cheap, I don't mean like just, they're not terrible. Um, let's talk about them. Exhaust only means you're going to have bath fans installed in your bathrooms, I hope. We could just leave one of those on all the time. If we've got 100 CFM of ventilation that we need to do for the whole home, then let's just leave a 100 CFM fan on all the time. That will do the job right, but let's think about the path of least resistance. When you exhaust air out of, let's say, a bathroom in the far end of the house, that air that's coming in to replace that is not coming from the other end of the house and filtering and diluting all the air on the way. The path of least resistance is clearly right near that bathroom. So now we've set up a ventilation strategy that's like localized. It's for that area of the house. It's not for the whole house. So that's not really whole home ventilation at that point. 
The other alternative is supply only, which is where we take a duct from outside into the return plenum of your HVAC, your central duct system. And every time the air handler kicks on, it pulls air from the house and also pulls air from outside, a smaller amount. And then it mixes the two together, filters them, and then sends them through the conditioning equipment to be distributed to all the rooms. That's like actually fantastic. It's very sophisticated. I will tell you that that only works, neither of these works on a very airtight home. And nowadays when people are using things like uh, intentional air sealing without spray foam, which is totally doable, or spray foam itself, which a lot of people are convinced is like that's the, the silver bullet that's gonna solve all their problems. Not true, but they're still gonna use it anyway. You cannot use either of these strategies anymore, and I will show you an example. This is the tiny house on wheels that we bought, uh, not bought, excuse me, we built with my parents and toured around the country. We toured this 13,000 miles. It's 200 square feet. We lived in it for five years. If you wanna know more about that, I'm linking a playlist on the screen right now. Um, but it's got 1,800 cubic feet of air inside of it. Tiny houses are very dangerous. Let me just say that. And if you wanna know more about that, there is a tiny house course that I've got to help you kind of predict and prevent a lot of the things that are happening to people who build tiny houses that then result in them having to literally throw them away because they, they just get moldy and who wants to buy a tiny house that's full of mold at that point. So exhaust only in a home that's this tight and this, these are my blower door test uh, readouts here, you can see. I won't bore you with the details. All I'm trying to say is that in the first graphic over here, you can see I got to 50 pascals, 50.3, and 47.1 is my blower door test. That's how many CFM I'd have to run to do a blower door test on this house. That means that if I was to go and get a typical bath fan, which is 50 CFM, and put it in the bathroom, every time I used it, I would be doing a blower door test on this tiny house. That is a terrible thing to do. And by the way, you'll see tons of tiny houses out there that are spray foamed and have bath fans in them. And yes, that is a terrible idea. And yes, things will continue to go wrong with those. Um, I know because I have clients who live in tiny houses. And so exhaust only, you can't do. Supply only, you also can't do because we have to exhaust from bathrooms. That's one of the rules. You gotta have spot ventilation, not just for the toilet odors, but also for the shower, which is more important. And so, Supply only, if I was to pipe in air and pressurize the inside of this tiny house, what would initially happen because of path of least resistance is that the dampers on any fans that are installed would blow open. And in this case, my kitchen is before my bathroom and my kitchen has an exhaust fan in it that goes directly outside. So if I pressurize the house, like for example, when I close the door, you can hear that little damper go, it blows open and, and shuts. Now that's gonna result in me not having any bathroom ventilation at all. So I can't use that either. By the way, I can't also use a system that has two fans that switch all the time. And if you've looked into that, I just wanna make sure that you understand that that does not induce a consistent pressure imbalance. So you need to have balanced ventilation in a home like this. So we draw air out over the shower, we supply air to the back of the house, and we get this tidal movement of air from the back of the house where that low window is up to the front where the blower door is installed. We put in about 30 CFM, and that results in one air change per hour. Now let me just say, you might think that sounds crazy. A whole change of air from like literally all the air inside the house gets replaced with outside air every hour. That is why an ERV core is incredibly important in a home like this to both balance the temperature and humidity as the air cycles. But also there is a special thing about small spaces, which is that the amount of surface area and stuff inside of it, the surface to volume ratio is so high that if I can keep all my materials at the right temperature, it doesn't matter if I cycle outside air, whatever temperature it is through there once an hour, it'll maintain temperature because air does not hold very much heat. Uh, and if I can strip some of that humidity out or also have a dehumidifier, which I have in this house, I have in this house that I'm talking to you from too, uh, it's very important to have a dehumidifier. So if you're gonna retrofit ventilation, not just on a new tiny house on wheels, which is kind of a weird example, but here's my parents' house again. Now we're back at this house where we specifically set up a pressure imbalance earlier so that we would not ever have the living space above be lower pressure than the crawl space below for radon reasons. So now we've renovated the kitchen. And of course they wanted to put in kitchen ventilation because it's very important. If you're gonna do one thing for your home aside from radon control, it's maintain a uh, kitchen exhaust hood that goes outside and use it every single time you cook. 
So if you uh, are going to do that and not provide makeup air, then we're definitely gonna be affecting the pressures in the house. So we have to have makeup air for this because we wanna maintain that pressure imbalance that we set up for the radon. So now this is where you start having to think more critically about all this stuff. Uh, because if you were to just do what they tell you at the big box stores is fine, that's not true. Every home is different. Every home has specific things that try you're trying to achieve, um, different family dynamics, different behavior, et cetera. So what we've done here is hooked up one of these April air dampers that is mechanically activated. Every time I turn on the exhaust hood, this thing will open. I also have it piped through a filter, which is very important, and a fan. Uh, they make these, they're called 8145s or 8144s. It's just a box that has a filter and a fan in it. The filter can be upgraded to MERV 13, which is always a good idea because pollen is a very small particle. You wanna make sure that those can get filtered out, dust, things like that. So the air that's being brought inside by this small fan with a filter on it is uh, clean air, and that's important. Now, this kitchen exhaust hood runs 450 CFM. The little fan that I've installed runs about 170 CFM. That's not enough, but what I've done is given it a little bit of a boost and given it a path of least resistance to make that air up from. And we can know for a fact that this works and that it maintains that pressure imbalance that we set up for the radon by just testing it with a simple manometer. And nowadays you can get manometers, micro manometers, that are as cheap as $500. Anything less than that doesn't do what you think it does. So last thing is cover your durability. This is all about moisture because moisture is a very big deal. So what you want is ultimately to reduce the sources of moisture in the home. That's why we have things like spot ventilation in bathrooms. You want to make sure that you also are dehumidifying because as homes get tighter, as they get better insulated, their HVAC systems get smaller, which means that they are going to run less often and therefore are going to dehumidify less. We have not been sizing HVAC systems for basically all of modern history to control humidity. We've been installing them to control temperature. And you can talk about this with your HVAC uh, professional because they are saying uh, design temperature. They don't ever say design humidity when they do a load calc for you for one of the homes that you're building. So you can dehumidify during construction as well. And this is very important. As you're building more airtight, as soon as you get dried in, the house stops drying out because the sun is not shining inside anymore and you don't have any ventilation because there's no electrification inside. So this is uh, a strategy that we used on this house. As soon as I had the subfloor over the crawl space, I had a dehumidifier running down there 24 hours a day, just maintaining. And by the way, this graph that you see on screen is the graph from the construction site as we were building. You can see that the temperature goes up and down slightly because it's very well insulated and very airtight. The dew point goes up and down to track with the temperature, but the relative humidity is flatlined. And that means that I'm not growing mold in my house before I move into it, before it's even finished. That is happening in homes right now, literally down the street from you as they're being built. They are growing mold before they put the drywall up and then you move into a house that's got mold in it. So we should <laughs> be controlling for this. By the way, an ERV is not a replacement for a dehumidifier, just to be perfectly clear. Uh, so if you are going to be able to retrofit this, we've got a home that's in Illinois here that's 2,400 square feet. We've got a fully ducted ERV because they went with the ductless mini split option as well. Everybody's crazy about ductless right now. So we have to have a duct system for the ventilation at that point, and they already have one installed. But this ERV is about 150 CFM for this size house, just like the ones in this house are 150 CFM. So we've got ductless mini splits, which have a 95% sensible, 5% latent split typically. That means that most of the energy that they put into themselves is for cooling and very little of it is for drying. So if you have ductless, you especially need dehumidification. So we need the dehumidifier. How are we gonna duct this thing? Because if you just put it into the basement and let it pull air from the basement and push air into the basement, you get a feedback loop, number one, you're not distributing it throughout the house. You're definitely not doing a whole home dehumidifier at that point. So we need to use a ductwork, the one that serves the ERV is not sufficient because a dehumidifier pushes about 200, let's say 200 to 300 CFM or more. 
that's at least doubling the CFM that we're pushing through this ERV ductwork, which is going to mess with the pressures. It's going to mean that both pieces of equipment do not work properly. So what we can do instead is pull the air from the bathrooms to the ERV, just like we've been doing, but supply them instead of going directly into the bedrooms, go into a slightly upsized supply plenum that then we can also dump our dry air from the dehumidifier into and distribute that into bedrooms. Bedrooms are places that you're sure you're going to spend at least eight hours a day. So they're a safe bet when you're going to be piping air in. So this is just a small modification to be able to get your house to do whole home things to control these invisible dynamics of physics, chemistry, and microbiology. Now, ultimately, this stuff is not hard. I used to play piano for ballerinas for a living. And now I, I know how to think around all these corners. So all you need to do, if you're a builder, if you're an HVAC contractor, if you are a homeowner that wants to kind of start taking more control of your home, is to think about these, this 4321, and I'm linking that explanation of how home performance works on screen right now. Don't bring bad stuff inside. Ventilate the home. Keep it dry so that you can cover all of these different aspects of the home and everything works properly. This can work for every single home in the world if we use the right uh, thinking, we take the time, we use the right products in the right combinations. So thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, if you have things to add or questions, again, please comment below, like, and subscribe. Tune in next time.